beginner rules of golf. So this is beginner uh, level. Um, I'm going to speak to uh, to that level. So I, I apologize up front. I mean, no disrespect to those who have some experience, but I'm going to try to keep it to the level of someone who's hit some balls, played the odd round, uh, still in the infant stages of the game. I'm going to discuss uh, a variety of rules. I'm not going to go through all of them, uh, some definitions, some terminologies, uh, maybe a little bit of uh, what we should do, some etiquette, pace of play, and some other things as we go throughout. I strongly suggest getting yourself a rule book um, at some point or checking out all uh, the many rules links on the Golf Manitoba website. There is a ton of information there and a lot of good links to find a lot of good information about the rules. And I would also suggest that there are some excellent apps um, from the USGA and the RNA. I have them both on my phone. I use them a lot when I'm doing rulings. Uh, they're excellent. So on the USGA or the RNA. Uh, my name is Gordon Hudson. I've been a rules official with Golf Manitoba for uh, somewhere around 17 years. I hold what's known as a national rules certification. I referee primarily at Golf Manitoba events and I do uh, the PGA of Manitoba locally. I've done a few national events when they are held here in, uh, in Manitoba. And uh, we have a couple coming up this year as well. So that's good. Um, we were supposed to have in the background, Don McDonald, who was another rules official, but as luck would have it, he got kicked out of this presentation. So that kind of threw us into a curveball. But uh, Lisa Anderson from uh, Golf Manitoba, the director of competition is also uh, in the background. And uh, Betty Grant's back there too as a, a very, very experienced rules official. So um, we're gonna have some questions and, and whatnot, but I, I can't stress enough, do not fear the rules of golf. Uh, they can be your friend. Uh, yeah, I'm a little opinionated being a rules official, but I honestly believe that the more you understand the rules, the more you will enjoy this great game. I am convinced that 90% of golfers think they know the rules, when in actual fact, it's closer to 10%, which is not surprising, actually, when you figure, yeah, there's only 24 rules, but they're made up of 99 <laughs> subsections, 263 interpretations, 79 definitions, where a huge amount of rulings are made based on definition alone, uh, 81 model local rules, there's nine section of committee procedures. There's just no way to know them all unless you happen to have to be a rules official. And even there's no way we can know every single one of them. That's why we carry around our rules Bible. Uh, a couple of housekeeping rules, uh, just before we get started, uh, please turn off your audio and your video. There's no need for it uh, at this stage. Uh, we find that the system works way uh, better without them. Um, if you have any questions, please use the chat feature. Um, for, uh, Lisa will monitor those. Uh, questions that come up. There is no such thing as a stupid question. Uh, I guarantee that the question you're thinking so is someone else that's on this presentation. So please ask it. Um, but you can turn off your audio and video. Um, we tend to hear some things that we probably shouldn't because people forget to do that. And we've actually seen some things we shouldn't be seeing. So please turn them off right now. At the end of the presentation, we'll open up the mics and you can ask some further questions if you have them. This is 90 minutes, so I'm going to try and take a five-minute break around the 740 mark for, uh, for a quick needs break, uh, but we're going to get started uh, right away. So we'll start off, good spot, uh, spot to start, rule one, and this is pretty much the premise of everything there is to do on the rules, uh, that we play the course as you find it, and you play the ball as it lies. When, before you're about to do something, when you're on that golf course, ask yourself those two questions. I got to play by the way I find this golf course in the condition it is and the way it is. And I got to play the ball the way it sits there. I don't get to alter that unless there's a rule that allows me to do it. So we got to play by the rules uh, and you play in the spirit of the game. And in this game, you apply your own penalties. Uh, it's not like a hockey game where some referee is sitting there to, to call you on it, you call your own penalties. Some major factors to be considered here is that are your actions deliberate or was it accidental? Are your actions reasonable or not reasonable? 
key factors to keep uh, into consideration at all times. As I mentioned, the player is responsible to know your rules. Uh, you are to recognize them when you break them. Um, it, it's, it's all about you catching yourself. You are expected to be honest uh, and failure to apply a penalty if you're in a tournament situation or your club championship or, or whatever, that would equate to disqualification. I appreciate that if you're beginning at this game, you're probably not playing in any tournaments, but keep that in mind that uh, failure to apply a penalty, penalty has the seriousness of being disqualified. So we must apply penalties to ourselves if, uh, if they're there. We cannot agree to ignore a rule. And in tournament play, for example, that would also equate to disqualification. You can ask any question about the rules. If you're unsure about what you're doing, uh, you can certainly ask your, your opponent or who you're playing against or your playing partner. That is not considered advice, which would be a, a breach of a rule by asking for like, what club are you playing, that kind of thing. Um, so our penalties, I've, I, I mentioned about breaking a rule. There are three types of penalties. Uh, you get a one stroke penalty, there's a two stroke penalty and there's disqualification. The one stroke penalty applies in both stroke play and in match play. I'll talk about the differences in a minute, uh, but they are for uh, minor, minor breaches. The two stroke penalty, which is it's termed general penalty. So it's a two stroke penalty in stroke play, or it's a loss of hole in match play. That's more of an advantage. It's more of a significant um, breach that you've, you've gained a more significant advantage over your the field of, of players or your opponent and therefore the penalty is just a little bit more two strokes or loss of hole and then finally disqualification as it says there that disqualification is more serious misconduct or you get a huge advantage or a high advantage over your opponent or your the, over the field um, some form of, of a breach of conduct uh, it's serious enough to be uh, kicked out of the tournament so basically three penalties, you get a one stroke, two stroke, or you're DQ'd. Most important thing here uh, for the rules is that you, it's important to know the various areas of the course, where the ball lies and the status of any interfering objects or conditions, because that will often affect the player's options uh, for playing the ball or taking relief under rules. So let's take a look at those. The golf course is, there's five areas of the golf course that we need to be concerned of. The general area is everywhere in the golf course, except the four areas that are numbered there on your screen. So there's five areas, there's four specific areas. The general area encompasses most of the course. It's where we hope our ball is most often played, um, which in, it includes every type of ground, all the growing objects, it's uh, attached objects. It includes the fairway, it includes the rough, it includes trees. Um, the other four specific areas are the teeing area, the bunkers, penalty areas, and putting green. So the five find areas of the course are one, the teeing area. And the teeing area is the, the teeing area that you, the player, are teeing off from or starting the hole at. It's where you're teeing off. It doesn't involve the other teeing areas. So for example, in this particular uh, image that you're looking at with the arrows, I'm playing from that teeing area. And let's say if I'm playing with my wife and she's playing up uh, at a forward set of tees, those tees are not tee teeing areas as far as my play is concerned. That's part of the general area. When my wife tees off from the red up at the front there, that's her teeing area. So it's the teeing area the player must start in using that hole. Second area on the course is the bunkers. This deals with all the bunkers on the golf course. It's not just the bunkers on my particular hole I'm playing. It's anywhere on the golf course. So the, and that bunker is a specially prepared area. It, uh, it would not deal with, uh, for example, waste bunkers for the, for the definition. Um, we're gonna talk more about that under rule 12. Uh, all penalty areas. And penalty errors does not necessarily mean marked uh, if it deals with uh, water hazards, as we know the old term. Um, 
most notably, these are water hazards, but they can be any area defined as a penalty areas. And that's those other defined areas other than water are often areas where we might uh, tend to lose balls or it's unable to be played. And they could be marked as a penalty area. Um, they too have their own uh, special rule under rule 17. And we're gonna discuss that as well later. And then finally, the last uh, of the four specific areas is the putting green. And this is the green of the whole your plane. Again, it's, it's very similar to the T in the sense that it's just on your hole or the one you're playing. It, it also has its own rule, um, number 13 or rule 13. Uh, if it's you accidentally put your ball on a different green, like a practice green or a different hole, let's say there's, there's two greens close together, uh, that would be considered a wrong green. You cannot play from there. Uh, you must move your ball. It's free. You don't get any penalties for doing that. Uh, and we're going to speak to that later. So in summary, you have uh, five areas. You have your team area. You have all the bunkers on the golf course. You have all the penalty areas on the golf course, your putting green, and then everywhere else, which is called the general area. So let's say, for example, you're playing early in the year. Um, they've got temporary greens at your golf course. If you hit it on the, the green, they don't want you to play on because you have a temporary green that the original green would be a wrong green. You have to take it off there because you're playing to a temporary green. It's the green you are playing on your hole on that given day. So key to know those five areas. Quickly, we're gonna talk about uh, rule three. We're gonna breeze over this one real quick. It covers three central elements of all golf competitions or play. You're either gonna play match play or you're gonna play stroke play. You're either gonna play as an individual or you might have a partner and you keep your gross score, your actual score, or you may play in a handicap competition where you might get um, some form of, of reduction in your, in your strokes. Uh, again, I, I mentioned earlier, we're gonna primarily talk about stroke play, which means adding up your strokes. So that's where you shoot your 90 or your 100 or in match play is basically a hole by hole competition. Uh, if you make a four on, a, on the first hole and I make a five, you had the lower score, so you won the first hole and you're one up. It doesn't matter whether you make a seven and I make a 20, you still had a lower score and you won the hole, you're one up. It doesn't matter by how much you win the hole, you just, you're one up. And whoever wins the most holes wins the match. It's a hole by hole competition. Rule four, again, we'll breeze over this pretty quick. Uh, the clubs in your bag and the ball you're playing, it must conform to the rules of golf. Uh, there's a list a mile long of what's conforming, but suffice to say that if you, if you bought them in a pro shop or a golf town or similar, uh, chances are they're conforming. If you end up with a, find a golf club on Kijiji that has, uh, you know, welds on it, uh, some steel welded in it, or it's bent out of shape, or something to that effect, well, chances are that's non-conforming. Um, I don't think it's gonna be a huge matter for you until you end up playing in tournaments, but um, that's probably when it would become a concern uh, about conforming and not conforming or which type you're ball playing. Uh, the reality of it is 99.9% .9 of the clubs you're gonna buy are conforming as are the golf balls. So how many clubs can we have? And the key is you can have 14 clubs, uh, you can have less, you don't have to carry 14, but you cannot carry more than 14. Um, you can have them in any combination. So um, typically you go like three to wedge and, you know, a three wood and a hybrid and a driver or whatever and a putter, but you can have them any combination. So theoretically you could have a driver and carry 13 different putters if you wish. It's your choice. I mean, we've often heard of uh, Phil Mickelson carrying two drivers on a, in a tournament, uh, Tiger, played St. Andrews without a driver. So um, it's your choice. You can carry any number of different clubs you want. Just you can't have more than 14. Uh, this is my, uh, my community service announcement to always carry in your equipment a Sharpie. Uh, in addition to the clubs you have uh, and the ball you have in, the, in your pocket, please have more than one tee so you don't have to go back to your bag to grab an extra tee. 
Um, you need your divot tool to fix ball marks on the green, and you need a ball mark to mark the position of your ball, and you need a Sharpie. Every golf bag needs a Sharpie uh, to put your own identifying mark on your golf ball. So you and your partner have identical golf balls in the middle of that screen, that Titleist one, you have the same one. If you can't distinguish between them, then it's considered a lost ball. So have a Sharpie, put your little initials on, uh, whatever you wish, but mark it up. So we're gonna get uh, started to uh, playing the round. The rule discusses, this rule discusses how you play around such as where and when you can practice starting on time. Uh, this is where we talk about uh, keeping up the pace of play. This is always a pet peeve of, of experienced golfers versus uh, learning golfers because logic says that the person learning how to play is gonna take more strokes. Taking more strokes takes more time. Uh, we all wanna play quick. We don't wanna be out in the golf course for six hours. So we all take our, our do our due diligence to try and keep up the pace of play. Uh, and that means to be prepared for your next shot that, you know, with putting on your glove and checking your yardages, tossing your grass, choosing your club, um, that kind of thing. So you have to keep going. The rules recommend to make your stroke in 40 seconds. So that's a relatively quick time. You make your stroke in 40 seconds when it's safe to do so. Obviously, if you're ready to play and the green is not clear of players, it's not safe to play, so you may take more than 40 seconds, but use that as your target. Order a play. Uh, in 2019, uh, there was a whole rewrite of the, of the rules, and this is a key one that changed things. Uh, I still see that uh, a large number of people still believe that it's the furthest person away from the pin or the green plays first. Well, that's true, but the new rules state that you can play in any order you know, play. You don't have to play furthest first. Uh, the key factor here is play in any order if it's safe to do so. So if somebody's having trouble with a club or getting a glove on or, you know, that whatever reason, uh, you can play out of turn. You ask your partners, says, look, I'm ready to go. Uh, I'll go now. And even though the other person is, is away. It doesn't have to be the first away who plays first, even in match play. Uh, if in match play, if the players agree to play at a turn to save time in a particular shot, fine. Um, but don't think the furthest one always has to play first because it's just no longer a factor. So playing a hole, this is where we're going to start getting into uh, the meat of things. Um, you must start play from anywhere within the teeing areas I mentioned. So what defines that teeing area? The teeing area is defined in this diagram by our tee markers. And you see the two clubs on the ground there that it's um, two club links back from the outside edges of our marker. I'm gonna show you in the next diagram, but it's two club lengths is based on the longest club in your bag excluding a putter because sometimes people have those long putters which are actually longer than a driver so um, let's take a look at this diagram here so it's measured your teeing area is measured by the outside edges of your tee markers back two club lengths you must tee your ball up within that area if you don't there's penalties apply um, as you can see in the top portion there you got the uh, the red with the white x i'll call it a red x uh, that would obviously not be in the teeing area but the one touching the line with the check mark to the right of that that is in the teeing area the one on the left touching the line is in the one at the back touching the line is in and the one on the right uh, the red x outside is is not within the teeing area so it's outside the teeing area uh, here, it makes no sense to me why people tee up right on that line. Like six inches isn't gonna make any difference after your tee shot. So tee up a foot back and make sure you don't get any penalties. If you do tee up in front of that line or outside the teeing area, that is a two stroke penalty and you must correct the mistake. 
in stroke play. You must retake your or take your shot, or you would technically be disqualified in, in tournament play or in your club play. If, uh, in match play, there's no penalty for teeing up where that red X is, but your opponent who you're playing your one-on-one -on -one match with could say, hey, you know what, Gord, you teed up in front, I need you to re-tee that shot. And uh, you would have to do that. So um, if, if I tee up from that red spot and I, I slice it out of bounds, well, my opponent may say, hey, you know what, that's a tough break. Uh, I'm not gonna say anything to him because I can ignore that breach of a rule under match play. And uh, I'm gonna have to re-tee or replay my shot. And, uh, and so obviously it's beneficial to, uh, to my opponent not to have me redo that. Uh, we always hear this when you're teeing up and you're, you're about to tee up, the ball's teed up, you got your driver and you knock the ball off just tap it and everybody in your group goes one. Well, it's not one. It's not a penalty to do that. Your ball is not in play. So you don't get any penalties for accidentally moving your ball off the tee. And just as a, as a note, maximum length of your tee is four inches. So you can't go and grab this big eight inch tee because if you like that. The rules do stipulate how long your tee can be. So four inches. While we're on rule six, this is, uh, covers a wrong ball. Uh, obviously we, we play our own ball, the one with the markings on it. Um, there is a penalty for playing a wrong ball. Um, that's why we mark it with that Sharpie to be sure. Uh, if you play a wrong ball, it's a two stroke penalty in stroke play or a loss of hole in match play. Uh, and you, in stroke play, you must caress the mistake. I mean, it doesn't matter whether you correct the mistake in match because you've already lost the hole by playing it. Um, so you must, you, you, you just have to mark your ball. It's just good practice. And, and here's an example. You pull out that brand new sleeve of Pro V1s that cost you $18 and you tee up the first one, slice it right, and it's in the bush. Now you pull out your second one and you slice that one exactly the same spot. And then you pull out your third one, you slice that one right in the same spot. And you go up there and you find all three. But there's no way to tell which one was the first, which one was the second, or which one was the third. So the rules state you pick one, but it's considered your third. And therefore you're now hitting your sixth shot. So even though we all know that one of those is likely your first one. So mark them, put like one dot on your first one, two dots on your second ball, three dots on your third. So you can distinguish the way it is. Um, if the last point bullet there, if someone else plays your ball by mistake, and this happens often or not often, but you hit a ball out in the fair when you see someone come over from another hole and they hit the ball, which you believe is yours. And you get up there and your ball's not there. Uh, the KVC is, is short for known or virtually certain. If you know or you're virtually certain that someone just hit your ball, well, then you can replace it on the original spot or estimated spot to where it was. Uh, and by definition, known or virtually certain means you're 95% sure that that's, that's where your ball was. Let's take a look at rule seven. Uh, ball search, finding and identifying your ball. When you're searching for your ball or you're trying to find it, and if you do find a ball and you want to identify it, you can take reasonable actions to search for your ball. If you get carried away and start throwing stuff all over the place or stomping down, uh, ripping grass out, or improving conditions where your ball may end up being found, uh, there may be penalties applied. So having said that, how do we search? Um, you can fairly search for your ball. That's the way the rules read. Um, you can take reasonable actions. So it's not unreasonable for, I play golf at Southwood where we have tall fescue grass to sweep your leg around uh, moving the grass to try and find your ball. That would be reasonable. If I start ripping grass out with my hands looking for it and to identify a ball, I pull the grass away or start spreading it away well, that would be deemed unreasonable. So uh, you may move some sand to identify a ball or some water, uh, for example, in some temporary water or to identify it in a, in a creek, for example, um, as long as it's reasonable. 
you can move, you can bend, you can even break growing objects or natural objects if it's reasonable. And I think we all know uh, when things get a little excessive because we want to remember those principles back from uh, the third slide we looked at that you always ask yourself, if what am I doing here? Does it, does it meet the conditions of playing the course as you find it and playing the ball as it lies? Or am I changing the conditions or the course? So those are things you want to keep uh, in the back of your mind. There's no penalty during a search if you accidentally move your ball while searching. Uh, there used to be, not anymore. And that's, that's a super good rule now. So if you feel like you've moved the ball while searching, so like you're sweeping that, that grass that I mentioned about and you kick a ball, well, you estimate where you believe that ball was uh, in relation to where you may have kicked it to. Uh, and you might even estimate where, you know, I felt like that was on the top of my foot when I kicked it. So it might've been sitting up nicely or if you step on a ball and you push it down. So now you'll lift that ball back up uh, to a spot where you believe. And again, I, I go back to that slide, uh, that third slide or fourth slide when we talked about that. Um, this is a game where you catch yourself uh, making a penalty or doing the right thing about being honest and and uh, playing within the spirit of the game. So can you get away with a lot in this game? Oh, absolutely. But because there's no one there to watch it. So, but it's not the spirit of this game. So um, you can take uh, a ball move by accident, searching accident, no problem. And how much time do we have to search? Used to be five, only three minutes now. So uh, three minutes is uh, still long enough. And uh, we certainly found as, as rules officials that most people gave up at three minutes anyways, um, which is no doubt the premises of why it changed from five to three. So you don't get five, you get three. Uh, where are we? So I mentioned about course uh, played as it is found. Um, your ball is in a cactus. Uh, this will be a nice uh, Phoenix round or something. Uh, unfortunately, you don't just get to move it out. Uh, you, you can move it out, but it'll cost you. And what I mean by costing you, well, that's a stroke penalty. If you if you feel the ball is in a position that it's unplayable, uh, you're certainly entitled to move it. But it's with parameters, as the rules define. <coughs> Excuse me. And it, you just can't move it free. It's It'll cost you stroke penalty. So let's take a look at that. Here's an acronym that... Um, Every person should know that if there's if there's one single most important thing you can learn, it's this: the the cats, the condition affecting the stroke. It's possibly the most breached section of the rules, not just by beginners but by everyone. Um, if you only want to read one rule, read this one, uh, and you'll find it at eight point one. So let's take a look at this: conditions affecting the stroke. There's five conditions affecting the stroke. There's five cats. Uh, one is the lie of the player's ball at rest. Two, the area of intended your stance. Three is the area of the intended of your swing. That's the backward motion and the forward motion after hitting it. Uh, four is the line of play. So that means where do you plan on this ball projecting to? And five is the relief area where you're gonna end up dropping or placing a ball. So it's, it's not part of your your play, but if you are going to have to drop for under some form of rule, then um, you're certainly entitled to uh, remove loose impediments or uh, like some twigs or some leaves before you make that drop. Um, or the, in that drop area, there's an empty beer can or a cigarette or something like that. Um, you can certainly move that, but you know you got to drop into an area and it's kind of the grass isn't great, so you step all over it and flatten it down real nice or there's some sand and you smooth out the sand to make it nice for your drop, uh, that you would not be able to do because you cannot affect the condition of your release uh, relief area by changing the, the uh, ground condition. So let's look at the not allowed part. So as I mentioned here, the, the move, bend or break anything, uh, which means your natural objects or your tree branches or 
like stomping on tall grass behind your ball. This is one you see the beginner golfer or uh, it's not just the beginner where the ball is lying in tall grass and you, you kind of spread it with your hands to make it so you can see the ball and make it easier for it to hit. Uh, here you are affecting the area of your ball, the lie of the ball. You're not entitled to do that. Um, you can't uh, snap a tree branch to get a better angle at your ball. Um, it, it, you just have to play it as it lies. Um, this is also a, a situation where you, I've heard it a zillion times where guys say, well, if I back into the branch, I can do pretty much anything, which is, is just not true. You must take the least obtrusive method to get into that tree to play your ball. And yeah, there might be a time where backing in is the least one obtrusive, but um, if there's another way you can get in without bending that branch, then that's the method you must take. So uh, you cannot start uh, playing the dance in the grass or moving tree branches or locking them into another tree, like doing some weaving. Um, it's just, you're just not entitled to that, uh, that action. So um, the immovable obstruction integral or boundary objects, um, for example, in an out of bounds stake, uh, your ball is next to it. You cannot move a boundary stake uh, to play your ball. You must play around that or have a weird stance or something to that effect. Um, a, a penalty area, like a red stake, that you would be entitled to move, but not an, a, a boundary object. Or the T mark of your tiering area, like you play the big slice or the big uh, draw and this T mark is kind of in your area or you can't just move your T, T marker, hit your ball and then put it back. It's uh, that you are not entitled to do. Uh, actions that are not allowed, um, move a loose impediment or a movable obstruction into position. You're certainly entitled to, to move a, a tree branch or a leaf or, or um, a bench if it's movable, but you can't move it into position to help you. Um, so that's the key word, into position. Um, you cannot alter the surface of the ground. Uh, fixing something like a replacing a divot in a divot hole. Let's say you're just off the green and you're going to try and putt this uh, ball from 10 feet off the green, but there's a big divot right in front of where your ball is, but then there's a piece of grass there. You can't fill that divot hole to, to make it a better putting area because uh, now you're altering the condition of the, of the ground in front of you. Uh, removing or pressing down divots that have been replaced. So it's the same thing. You, you just can't fix that or a ball mark on a green or pardon me, on a, on a fringe you, you could not fix. Any marks on the green, knock yourself out. You can fix anything on the green, whether your ball is on it or off it. So, uh, or a pitch mark in, in that regard. So uh, there's no concern. Uh, we all know you can fix a ball mark when your ball is on the green, but if you're slightly off, the question often comes up, can I fix that ball mark even though my ball is off the green? And yes, you can. So. Uh, creating or eliminating holes or uneven surfaces. Um, I think I've spoken to that already. Um, let's look at the last couple. Uh, four, you cannot remove or press down sand or loose soil. This kind of gets uh, down to definitions somewhat. Uh, let's say your ball is between a bunker and a green. Uh, so you're kind of on the fringe and somebody ahead of you may have had a bunker shot and there's sand all over the, the fringe and on the green. Uh, the sand on the green you can move, but the sand on the fringe you can't because by definition, sand or loose soil is not a loose impediment. Well, we know we can move a loose impediment, but sand or loose soil does not meet that definition. Therefore, on the fringe you can't, but on the green you can. And then uh, removing dew, frost, or water. I mean, you couldn't uh, lay your towel down to soak up dew in the morning because uh, it's not a, an action that is permitted. And if you did that, uh, penalty would be a uh, general penalty, which again, in stroke play is two strokes. In match play would be loss of hole. Let's look at this image. Um, we have a appears a, a divot on your ball as you walk up to this thing you see that divot can we remove that um, and if we go back to that 
that first premise, find the, uh, play the course as you find it and the ball as it lies. So in this situation, we, we've got a tough situation right at the look, but the, the key factor there is, is that divot attached or is it not? Um, if it's attached, well, then we play it like it is. If it's unattached, well, now it becomes a loose impediment and we can move it. Uh, key factor is that you can move the grass, but you can't move the ball. So if you move that grass and cause your ball to move, then you've caused your ball to move and we cost you a stroke penalty and you have to put it back. Uh, so no problem losing, moving a loose impediment. You just can't move the ball. So we talked about what you can't do. Let's talk about what we can do. Um, we can take reasonable actions to search for our ball, which is the fairly search for your ball. Um, you can take reasonable actions to remove leaves, sticks, or beer cans, or rakes, uh, as long as it's reasonable. Um, you can take, you can mark your ball's position, and you can lift it within what the rules state. Um, you can ground your club lightly, and grounding your club lightly means uh, it's the ground. The club is supported by the ground. That means you can't push down behind your ball and and push down that tall piece of grass that's kind of standing up. Uh, it means the club is lightly touching the ground, allowing the weight of the club to be supported by the grass, the soil or, or sand or other material that your, your club is. Um, I don't want to confuse you with the sand part because you, you can't ground your club in a bunker, but there could be sand somewhere else on a golf course. So um, if you improve the lie by pressing the club down more than lightly, then you would be subject to a penalty. Um, you can firmly place your feet, uh, which is no problem. You see people going to the bunker and they kind of wiggle their feet down. Uh, no issue regarding that. Um, but you could not kind of, if you're on a hill of that bunker, start sliding sand down to try and level your stance. That would be building a stance um, and that would be uh, no longer reasonable. Um, you can fairly make your stroke or backswing. So if you're in those trees, um, if you're testing your swing to see, well, can I make this shot or that tree branch in the way, um, you can certainly test it gently, but if you take a practice backswing and you knock a tree branch off the tree, which now you've changed the area of your intended swing and now there's no tree branch there anymore, well, now you've, you've breached section eight, one of the rules and you'd be subject to two stroke penalty. Um, if you decide, yeah, okay, I'm ready to hit my ball. And now you, you actually take your swing and you swing back, snap the tree branch, finish and hit your ball. No problem during your stroke or your backswing. That's fine, but you just can't clear your path. Um, in a teeing area, uh, you can, that's the one spot where you can alter the ground. Um, obviously in the putting green, there's a little difference there, but in the teeing area, you can tee up your ball, uh, or let's say you're hitting an iron off the ground, or the tee is low on the ground. You can step on the grass behind your, your ball in a teeing area because the ball is not in play. So, uh, but you do that on the fairway, you can't alter the ground. You can't step behind your ball and flatten the grass down on a fairway or in the rough. Um, it's uh, that action is just not allowed. In a bunker, uh, you can rake sand after the ball is out, um, but not for if it's in your line of play. Uh, if it's there to care for the course, uh, no issue at all. Uh, rule of thumb is uh, rake after, not while your ball is in there. Um, you can you can touch the sand in a bunker. Uh, if it's accidental or if you're putting your clubs down, but you can't touch it around the right in front of your ball or right behind your ball. We're going to talk about that a little bit later, but on a putting green, you can remove sand, as I mentioned, uh, or loose soil and you can fix damage. So now we can fix spike marks. Now we can fit pitch marks, uh, animal hoof damage. Uh, we can fix a lot of things on a putting green. Can't fix everything, um, but 99% um, of it we can so um and move a natural object to see if it is loose uh there's often times where like for example that picture of the divot 
uh, you don't know if it's loose or not. So you kind of touch it, give it a little tug and you realize, oh, this thing's still attached. No issue. As, as long as you put it back to, you must leave it and return it to its original position. So you pull that divot and you go, whoa, it's attached. Uh, just put it back lying on that golf ball and, uh, and move on. We are at 7.40. So let's take a, a five minute break. So go for a quick run and come back and we will reconvene in five minutes. Back to where I started from. So we're gonna talk about uh, rule 12 in bunkers and um, by definition, they're specially prepared areas of sand uh, and here we test the player's ability uh, from that sand and how they do. Uh, so there are some restrictions on touching the sand uh, before the stroke is made and where you can move the ball into certain rules, uh, allowing movement of the ball. Let's take a look at a bunker and we're just gonna say what's in, what's not. Uh, we've got those check marks there that would define that the ball is in a bunker. Obviously the one in the sand is clear. The one sitting on the rake uh, yeah, it's sitting on a movable obstruction, but it's within the confines of the bunker, which is the, uh, the edge of the bunker. Anything touching the edge of the bunker is in. Uh, if it's on the wall or face, like the top red X, uh, that is not in. And the one that is sitting on the green, uh, or the part of the grass there, uh, it's not considered part of the bunker, even though that grass portion is within that outer uh, circle of it. So uh, if you have a, a, a certain area of that bunker that the greens crew drags out, we all see it on some courses, uh, that sand that's dragged out of that bunker is not part of the bunker. Um, so if your ball is lying in that, you play it as it lies, uh, you cannot move that sand or, or move some away because as I mentioned earlier, uh, sand off uh, the green um, by definition is not a loose impediment. Uh, therefore, you cannot move that. So um, you just play it as it lies. So what can we do in a bunker? Um, we can remove loose impediments, like the, the girl in the picture there is moving leaves. We can do that now. Uh, we can move loose, or pardon me, movable obstructions. So if there's a beer can in there or a rake, um, something to that effect, a man-made object, we can move those too. A um, couple of key factors here is that there's no movement. So uh, if you move the ball while moving a leaf or a pine cone or, or an, an, a natural object, that'll cost you a stroke penalty for causing that ball to move. But if you move the beer can or the rake, there's no penalty there. Um, and you can certainly touch uh, some sand in some situations. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, for example, you, you bring three clubs into the bunker, you're not sure which one you're going to play with. You can put the other, you make a decision, you can put the other two down touching the sand. That's fine. Um, again, key factor is uh, if you're moving a natural object, a loose impediment, you don't move that ball. What you can't do, uh, unless you're Patrick Reed, uh, you can't touch the sand uh, immediately in front of or behind your ball. Um, you can't deliberately touch the sand to test it. So you're kind of curious, oh, is this fluffy sand? Uh, is it firm? You can't take a practice swing uh, hitting the sand. You can, say, you can take a swing to keep loose, but you can't touch the sand in doing so. Um, and you, when you're addressing the ball about to make your shot, you could not touch the ball, or pardon me, the sand in front of your ball or immediately behind it. So in that image there, that photo, uh, that you could not do. Um, even lightly touching it. So you, the, the, the key here is you hover your club above the sand. And if you touch it, it you would be penalized for that. The, the key is that, it, so you don't put your club down behind the ball and press it down by grounding it. And then when you pull your club back, you create a nice little slot there, the perfect hitting position. Uh, you, you can't, because now you're breaching that cats, that section one eight, uh, you're improving the air, the lie of your ball, the, the point one of it, and you're, you're improving the area of your intended swing. So, um, or the, of the position of that ball. So 
You cannot touch the sand immediately in front of or behind. Let's look at uh, rule 13, which is the putting green. Uh, this rule allows you to do things that are not normally allowed off the green, like marking and lifting the ball to clean it, uh, repairing damage to the course. And on the green, you're allowed to remove sand or soil. Um, th this is the one place where you're also not penalized if you accidentally move your ball. Um, which means there is a penalty if you accidentally move your ball anywhere else on the golf course. So if you're on the fairway and you take a practice swing and you hit your ball or you are just addressing it and you cause the ball to move, you have accidentally moved your ball, but it costs you a penalty stroke on the uh, general area or in a putting green or pardon me, in a bunker, um, in a penalty area, it doesn't cost you on a putting green. You just put it back. You must put it back. Uh, so accidentally movement of a ball is free only on a putting green. Um, where are we? So when is a ball on a putting green? Uh, when any part of it touches, you might have seen or uh, you're unsure whether a ball, that ball there and that image is on the green or not. You see somebody take a scorecard and just kind of see if they can slide it under the, uh, the short portion of that grass. And if it stops, well, then you know your ball's touching the short grass. Um, and then it, you can mark it, you can clean it. Uh, if it was on the, on the fringe there, then you cannot pick it up and clean it. So um, it's key to know the, as we mentioned way back when about the, uh, about the portions of the course, your ball's on the, on the green, you're entitled to mark it, pick it up and clean it off. In the general area, you're not. So as I mentioned about uh, marking, lifting and cleaning the ball, uh, if you wanna pick that ball up on a green, you must mark the position before lifting it. That is key. Anytime you wanna pick that ball up, uh, it must be marked. Um, and obviously you mark it, so you know exactly where to put it back. Um, you cannot putt with the marker still in position. So um, you mark, you pick it up, you clean it, do whatever you want, line it up, remove your marker. And you have to remove that marker. Uh, we now can leave the flag stick in the hole. Um, but you must decide before making your stroke whether you're going to leave it in the hole. So if you decide to leave it in the hole and you putt and you realize, oh man, I hit this a little too hard and you're yelling somebody by the green or you run up and you pull it out while the ball's still running, uh, no, you must make your decision and you live with your decision. Uh, and now th there's no penalty if the ball hits the flag stick, if it's, if it's left in the hole. If a ball, you've hit that stroke and your ball is sitting like this image, uh, it's leaning up against the, uh, the flag stick, is the ball considered hold? Uh, if any part of that ball is below the surface of the green, it's considered hold. So, and you don't have to wiggle the flag stick to make it drop. You can just pick it up at that point. Um, it's considered hold. If no part of it is below the surface of the putting green, it's not considered hold. So you would put it on the edge and it would, of the green and then you tap it in or we spoke quickly about a wrong green but if you are on a, the ball ends up on a wrong green which includes a practice green um, then you must take relief you have to take relief you don't have an option you're going like wow this is beautiful grass i'm going to play it from here i got a great shot so you don't have that option you must take relief and you go to the nearest spot off the green that regardless whether it's good or not. So if that were those at P1, uh, if that's a bush or something, and chances are it's not gonna be in a near green, but um, if the nearest point of complete relief, uh, that's where you, you position uh, your ball. So you take your stance that you're off the green P1 is your nearest point of complete relief. So you're off the green. Take the club that you would normally play with at that point. 
uh, that becomes your, the, the, the P1 becomes your reference point. And then you get a club length from there and you create a relief area. And that club length is the longest club in your bag. You don't have to bring your driver. I mean, obviously if you're on a green, uh, you may just have a wedge that you, you need. Uh, so you could measure the relief area with a wedge, but the reality of it is if your driver's 43 inches long and your wedge is 34 inches long, um, you still gain that extra foot that even though if it rolls out the end of that club head there. So you don't have to measure with a driver, but your relief area is based on the longest club in your bag, excluding your putter. Okay, so we've talked a lot about penalties and now you're gonna get penalty relief and you get free relief. So there's some situations where um, you get to take, uh, you get to move your ball and it won't cost you anything. So rule 15 and 16 talk about that. And rule 15 covers uh, taking relief from movable, natural um, and artificial objects, which uh, the areas are, are treated as, are not treated as part of the challenge of playing the course. So uh, it deals with moving things away from where your ball lies. Um, might be a bench or uh, a garbage can, something like that. Uh, rule 16 covers when and how a player may take free relief by playing a ball from a different spot than where their ball ended up. For example, on a cart path. Your ball ends up on a cart path, you can take relief. You don't have to, but you can, um, as opposed to moving an object. So. Um, another situation where you might be where you want to move your ball from a situation might be an animal hole, or you might be in an area marked ground under repair, or you're in temporary water, like a, a big puddle from a heavy rain that just recently occurred. So uh, those would be situations where you get free relief. You're not meant to be playing. That's not part of the challenge of the game. Uh, so you get free relief from those. Uh, you, relief is usually permitted under these circumstances. Uh, except in a penalty area. So if you are in a situation where a golf course has lots of treed areas marked red um, and your ball is sitting in a, in a puddle within that penalty area or it's sitting in an animal hole or there's a cart path running through that penalty area and your ball's on it, you do not get relief in a penalty area. Uh, the penalty area supersedes that. So uh, you would have to take either play it as it lies or take relief under the penalty uh, rule 17. So um, normally you would take relief by uh, dropping a ball in a relief area that you're gonna create uh, based on the nearest point of complete relief. And we're gonna talk about that here. So um, when taking relief from a situation like your ball in a cart path, you must go to the nearest point where you get complete relief from the cart path. And this does not mean the best point. It means the closest point. So in this image here, and uh, oh, hold on here. So see if I can draw here, this tree right here. Uh, if your ball is sitting here, your nearest point right might be by this tree in this area, or you, let's call, I, I think it's a bush. So let's call this a bush. Your nearest point, if your ball's, let's say over in this side, you're left-handed or something, your nearest point might be in that bush. So yeah, you might not be too pleased with that, but that's your nearest point of complete, complete relief. It's not your best point of complete relief. So my rule of thumb is never ever pick up that ball on the cart path until you determine where your nearest point of relief is because you may not like it. And therefore you may choose to play it off the cart path. If you pick that ball up and say, okay, I'm gonna take relief. And then uh, you realize, oh, wow, my nearest point of relief is over here in the bush. Uh, that's a tough break. And now you say, well, I should have moved. I should have played it from the cart path. Well, you can put it back down, but it's going to cost you a stroke penalty for picking that ball up. So um, it's your nearest point of relief with your stance and the ball position. So let's take a look at a diagram here. Um, in this diagram here with the nearest point of relief, and it's gonna be different uh, for the, the right-handed player versus the left-handed player. Looking at this diagram, you can see the nearest point of relief 
is also based whether you're right or left-handed. There's no bearing on where the ball is on the, whether it's on the, on the right half, or like we put a line right down the middle of this path here. It doesn't matter whether the ball is on the left side of the cart path or the right side of the cart path. It all has to do with the position of your ball when you take your stance. So for example, it's on the left side, this left-handed player, his nearest point of relief is gonna be on the right side of the cart path. If he was to stand here with his feet and put the ball position, this ball would be further from here than it is from here. So it has nothing to do with the center of that, that cart path. It may work out that way. For example, for this right-handed golfer that he's on the left-hand side, but when you come down to the discussion with your playing partner and you go, well, it's on the left side of the cart path, therefore I move to the left. No, it doesn't have to do with that. It has to do with the nearest point. So uh, again, here with these, with these two golfers, the right-hander, here's his ball. He moves over. There's the nearest point of relief. The left guy, even though it's the same position of the ball, his is over here because he has to get his feet off the cart path and then it's ball position. You take the club you would normally play from that position if that condition did not exist. So you take the club that you would play from here because assuming the cart path didn't exist, Let's say you would hit eight iron and that's the position you address yourself with to determine your nearest point of relief. Once you drop that ball, you can change clubs. Doesn't matter. You don't have to use your, your eight iron. It's just, that's how you determine your nearest point of relief with the club that you would typically use if the condition did not exist. Let's look on this one. It might be a little clear. So let's look at ball. Uh, ball position one, we're assuming a right-handed player and they're gonna take their nearest point of relief from this, the abnormal course condition, which is a cart path. In this situation, they go to the nearest point, which is P1. That's your reference point. And from that reference point, you create a, the relief area using one club length uh, parameter, longest club in your bag, not your dry, or pardon me, not your putter. And that becomes your relief area. And now you're gonna drop that ball within the relief area. It must drop in, stay in. If you drop it here and it rolls in to the relief area, you must redrop. If you drop it in the relief area and it rolls out, you must redrop. Uh, and the rule of thumb is drop, drop, place. You get two drops in a place. Uh, so if, if, if this was on a sloped area and it just kept rolling out, kept rolling out, well, then you drop once, you let it roll, drop, rolls. Next time you place it to where you last hit the ground. So you do have to try your, your two times um, and then you place. Let's look at the other side here now. So the same right-handed player and his ball position is off the cart path, but his feet would be on. So he gets relief from that. It should he choose, he doesn't have to. And now, so he takes his, his foot position off the cart path with his club he would play, we're using the example of an eight iron, in the direction that he's playing, and he puts a P down there where his club would be. That's his reference point at P2. Take your club length back, and you drop in, stay in within your relief area. You don't continue on with your club over here because that would put your feet back on the cart path, and you must, if, if you choose to take relief, you must take full relief. So, if there is, that ball is sitting here and there is a, a big tree here, think about whether you want to take relief from that ball position because you might be better off standing on the cart path and hitting it here. You bring it in here, now you've got a, an issue with that tree. So um, that's why I say, don't pick up that ball until it's time to make your decision. Dropping the ball. Uh, now it's your knee height, it used to be your shoulder height. Way back when you used to drop it over your shoulder, looking at the, uh, at the flag, you had to drop it over the back of your shoulder. I think knee height just makes sense. Um, it's your knee height. So you don't have to stand up perfectly straight. My knee height is 20 inches. I can lie on my back, but as long as I'm dropping it from 20 inches, um, you can't spin the ball, you don't chuck the ball. Um, 
you, you drop it from your knee height. All right, we're gonna talk about rule 15 here, which is uh, relief from loose impediments and movable obstructions. Uh, we've kind of talked about this already a bit. Loose impediments may be removed uh, on the golf course. It may now be removed anywhere from on the golf course. So now we can move them from uh, penalty areas. Uh, and we can move them from bunkers and you can move them by any means. So meaning that you can use uh, your hat, a towel, uh, whatever means you need to. Key here is if when you're moving a loose impediment, if the ball moves, it must be replaced. Um, if it's if it was on the putting green, if it was not on the putting green, the player gets one stroke. Uh, so you can move a loose impediment, you cause the ball to move, it's gonna cost you a stroke penalty. If it's a movable obstruction, like in this diagram, the uh, rake, you can move that rake. Uh, if the ball moves, it's not a penalty. Key thing there, is, as I mentioned, mark the position of that, uh, that ball, move the rake, it rolls, put it back. Uh, no penalty, just remember to replace that ball. Uh, you're gonna see this in bunkers for sure, where a ball uh, comes up against a rake. This is why as for Golf Manitoba, pre-tournament, we all, we go around as uh, referees and we move uh, the rakes out of the bunkers uh, pre-tournament just so you don't get into this situation where a ball uh, is up against the rake and, and it could cause havoc. Uh, let's say your ball lands on a, on a towel, not an issue. Uh, we know from um, this one, we know the exact position of the ball. So we mark it, move the rake, we can put it back. This one, we don't know the exact position of the ball because it's sitting on top of a towel. So uh, no problem moving the towel, but you're gonna lift the ball, move the towel, estimate where the ball was, because we don't know the exact position. And now we create a reference point. So the reference point is right here. We get the benefit here now of a one club length uh, defining factor on each side. With this relief area, you drop in, stay in. Uh, so you actually get a little bit more of a benefit. 2019 rules, this, this changed and was certainly for a benefit. So. Um, you can see how this benefits in the sense of, let's say you're sitting on a towel and there's your pin and there was a tree right here. Well, now where that tree was right here, now you get a club length either way. So that can certainly benefit you um, with a new drop. So let's take a look at... Uh, A ball or ball marker helping or interfering with play in a putting green. Uh, certainly, this is um, we're talking about uh, more so of the ball, but uh, this is one you see with the beginner play all the time. It, this happens to me with my wife all the time. It, is they get on the green, they never bother to mark your ball. Uh, so, and I sit there being Mr. Rules guy, and I'm going like, could you mark your ball? And because uh, if if I hit her ball that costs me two stroke penalties. So, uh, yeah, when I'm playing with her, it's you know we're we're just having fun here. But uh, always a good habit: mark pos the, your position of the ball and lift it up. Uh, when you mark it, you can clean it. A clean ball rolls better than a dirty one, uh, but you must replace it back on that original spot. Um, if you if it's just a tap in, or or you can choose to play first instead of lifting that ball if you wish. Uh, but you cannot leave it in a place to help another player, leave it as there as a backstop, for example. Um, like if you're sitting right by the pin and you go, oh, yeah, just leave it there for me because it'll, it'll help me out. Well, that you cannot do um, in a tournament. If you did agree to do that, you'd both be disqualified. So uh, we don't want to do that. Um, if you are uh, anywhere on the golf course, uh, that was on the putting green we were talking about, but anywhere on the golf course, you can still have a ball marked. So if you have a ball on a, on a fringe and I'm on the fringe close and I wanna putt and your ball's in my way, I can ask you to mark it. Uh, it's not an issue. You, you can still do it, but you just can't clean the ball. So, because you only clean the ball when it's on the green. 
so uh, you can mark it and you'll see in tournament play or you see how they pick it up with, a, with their thumb and their forefinger kind of gingerly and they'll place it off to the side. And you're not required to do that, but it kind of sends the message that, hey, I'm not cleaning it. Uh, and you, if it was dirty, like if you throw it in your pocket uh, while you're waiting for your, your player to, to play, there's always the chance that your ball gets clean when you throw it in your pocket. So that's why they do that, they put it off to the side. It indicates, hey, I'm not cleaning it. And that's, uh, that's key. And again, here, if you don't wanna do it in stroke play, uh, the player could play first, should they wish. I mean, we don't typically in match play because usually in match play, it's the furthest person away plays first. So, um, and there's advantages to that. So um, let's take a look at rule 16 which is abnormal course condition. So that's your, uh, uh, your cart paths, that's your puddles. Um, this rule covers how the player may take free relief from a situation and play a ball from a different location, such as a cart path. Um, again, these, things, these areas are not considered part of the challenge of the golf course. Again, these are free. They're in the general area. They're, uh, it doesn't cost you anything. We're gonna create a reference point and we're gonna find uh, which is the nearest point of complete relief. Uh, and we're gonna drop a ball in a one club length uh, relief area. So let's take a look at this. It looks like uh, a ball there is sitting on a sprinkler head. Uh, we have, or pardon me, uh, some form of marker. It could be a sprinkler head, could be a T marker. Um, you have interference from that. So it exists when the ball touches it or is in or on it, or it could affect your swing. Uh, and we, we typically look at uh, divot patterns. Uh, if you're gonna, maybe your ball's not sitting on it, but it's like within three inches of it and you may hit it through a divot. Uh, we don't want any injury. So um, we're gonna take that into consideration and uh, yeah, you would be in, entitled to relief there. If you have a, an abnormal course condition uh, that is affecting your stance or swing, that's, that's cool. I mean, you're gonna get relief from that, but if it's on your line of play, uh, you will not get relief from that. So if it, let's say there's a, one of those irrigation boxes or a, a bench that's 10 feet in front of you, uh, but it's gonna affect your ball flight, well, you don't get relief from that. The only time you get relief from line of play is if your ball is on a putting green. So if you have a puddle on the putting green, your ball is on the putting green, yeah, you would get relief from that, but not uh, typically on line of play. You may see it on TV on where they get relief from the stands, uh, or bleachers or, or stuff like that. Well, those are temporary movable obstructions that falls under an entirely different ruling um, and that you would get relief from. Temporary water. So the definition of temporary water is it's in a temporary, hence the name, accumulation of water on the surface of the ground, uh, like a puddle. Uh, and it could be from rain or it could be from overwatering of your irrigation system breaks or something to that effect. Uh, it can't be in a penalty area. Uh, it must be able to, to be seen um, either before you take your stance or after you take your stance. Um, and this is without pressing hard or doing your rain dance. Like you see people stand back and forth and they press real hard trying to make some water appear. Uh, it's just when you take your stance and the water must stay visible when you take your stance. Uh, it's not a momentarily that you, you stand there and go, hey, look, and then the water dissipates. It must remain present. And uh, things like dew and frost are not considered uh, temporary water, uh, snow and, and natural ice, um, other than frost, they are treated as either a loose impediment. So you could move the snow, uh, or you can consider it as temporary water of which you would get, you can take relief from as long as it's on the ground, like snow on a tree branch, uh, and your balls underneath and you go, Hey, there's some temporary water up there. So I want relief. Uh, no, you don't get that option. So, uh, it's, it must be on the ground. So manufactured ice, uh, like ice cubes are an obstruction and those, those you can move. 
let's look at some temporary water situations. And we're going to look on like on a fair, we will look at a green and we'll look at a bunker. So uh, the first one here is, um, remember that we have five areas of the course. And so this is where it starts to dictate as to uh, how you proceed. So in the general area where, where this one is, um, a ball laying in some ground under repair, that's this circle here, we'll call that uh, an abnormal course condition, could be ground and repair, could be a puddle, could be whatever. You find your nearest point of relief, uh, taking the club you would normally play with, had the condition not been there, and this becomes, we've determined that this is your reference point. And from your reference point, we use the longest club in our bag, not our putter, we create a relief area, a semicircle down, and we're going to drop from knee height, drop in, stay in. The ball must stay in there. If uh, it rolls out, we redrop. And our procedure there is drop, drop, place. You get two drops. If it rolls out the second time, you place it to where you last dropped it. So that's why you see in tournaments, they always point to where the ball landed because that's where you're going to place it. So that's the, uh, in the general area. Now we're going to look at a, if my ball is on a putting green and I'm in a puddle. Uh, so now in this situation, uh, on a putting green, we, again, um, you're going to get relief from the temporary water. You would take your full nearest point of complete relief. In this situation, we're using uh, balls sitting in a puddle. Uh, we've got a left-handed golfer. This becomes his nearest point of relief. And he gets his foot. The only difference, or his stance, pardon me. The only difference here is you don't get that club length. So and here you're gonna place. So um, if your ball was sitting back here, you're not in the water, but you do get line of play. So because your line of play would be in this direction, you get relief on a, if your ball's on the green, there's an abnormal course condition on the green, you get relief on line of play, not off the green, you know. And your line of play or you, your nearest point of relief may be over here. And it could be that depending on the shape of the green, your nearest point could be off the green. And if that's your nearest point, well, that's your nearest point. If, you're, if your ball was back here, off the green, we're gonna call this, uh, we'll call this off the green here, and you're, you're trying to get to this direction, and this puddles in your way and you can't putt, then that's just, you don't get line of play relief, therefore you'll have to putt through it or chip over it, uh, you just don't get that relief. Let's look at uh, the bunkers now. So uh, you still get free relief for a ball uh, if it's in a bunker, in a puddle or something like that. Again, you would create a reference point, which is your nearest point of complete relief in a bunker. Um, and you drop the ball within one club length. If there's no point, of complete relief in a bunker. Actually, this is true on a, on a, on a green as well. If you can't get out of the water, uh, then you take the point of maximum available relief. That's your reference point. This is a tough pill to swallow at times that you're saying, well, I'm standing in a puddle or my ball is in, you know, it had been in three inches of water and the best place you can take it, which is not close to the hole is in a half an inch of water. Well, then that's where you put it. So, or you drop it, uh, you, you get the point of maximum available relief. Um, let's take a look at a diagram here. So in the bunker, you're in an abnormal uh, course condition. Here's your spot of your original ball. And this is a big, huge puddle all the way around here like this. You go to your nearest point of relief would be uh, right in here. Now you create relief area. You could drop in there. Uh, that would be your maximum available relief, but pardon me, you're, you're still in that water. Or you go to your maximum available, which is uh, no near the hole. It's not like you go over here because that's close to the hole. So uh, perhaps maybe in the diagram, you'd be over here. Uh, maybe you'd still be standing in a little bit of water, but that's your nearest point of relief. In a bunker, you get one more option. And that is that you can take it out of the bunker, but it's gonna cost you a stroke. So. You do have that up in here, in the bunker, it's free. Out of the bunker, it costs you a stroke. So you could take it out, um, but it's going to cost you a stroke penalty. Getting out of a bunker is never going to be free. So um,
Let's look at uh, just a quick summary here of the bunker penalty relief option for a ball in a bunker, one stroke penalty. Uh, you create a reference point. Oh, I should have mentioned this, sorry. Um, that your relief on a bunker or outside of the bunker is back on the line relief, which means you take the flag where your ball was positioned in the bunker, you draw a straight line back and you can go back as far as you want. At some point you say, okay, this is good. You put a T down, you create your reference point and then you do your one club length either side, create your relief area, you must drop in stay in. And you can go anywhere you want along that area. So, but as soon as you put your reference point there, that becomes the, the point where everything is defined. So if you drop a ball here and you go to here, now your ball is rolled closer to the hole than your reference point. So that's, that would be a redrop situation. Again, we know our drops are drop, drop place. So if it rolled forward, you put it back uh, or you drop a second time. And then uh, if it stays in the area, fine. All right, penalty areas. These are the ones where it's gonna ding you a, a stroke penalty. Um, we have, uh, again, this is 17, is a specific rule that deals with penalty areas, which are bodies of water, usually, or there are other areas where the ball is often lost or it's unable to be played. Uh, for one penalty stroke, you can uh, take specific relief options. Uh, I know I'm ready, they're gonna fly through this. Um, let's take a look at the different ones. We know there's, there's two types, uh, a yellow and a red. There's some, uh, we now treat penalty areas uh, the same as a general area, which means you can lift loose impediments. You can ground your club now. Um, let's look at the red. So we're teeing off at one. You fire it into the water at this point, we got three options on a red. One, you can always go back and hit another one from one for your stroke and distance. The other two options, you have to figure out where the last point you cross the margin of the hazard, which is at X. It's not where, it, if you flew it over here, that's your point of entry. You don't come up to here and determine everything from that point. It's where it crossed the margin of the hazard. So your second option is back in the line relief. Again, you take the flag, straight line back to where it entered and go back as far as you want. Pick a spot, reference point, create a relief area, drop in, stay in. Or your third point is at point X where you entered. You can do lateral relief, which is two club lengths. Create your relief area and drop in, stay in. So on a red, you get two options, or pardon me, three. On a yellow, which is usually ones where you cross straight over, uh, the red is typically we used to call the lateral water hazard, which means the water's on the side. On a yellow, Again, you can always go back. You fired it into the water at this position here. That's your point of, of last cross the margin of the hazard. You can go back to where you last hit it from or your only other option on a yellow is take back on the line relief. So there's your flag back on the line, wherever you want, pick a spot, drop it down, reference point, create your relief area, drop in, stay in. What you don't have on a yellow is a two club length option. So you couldn't drop it here or you, let's say you land on the green, spin it back and it goes in at this point, there's your X. You don't have a club length option here. You must go behind the penalty area. And then you would have this, even though it enters at this point, that's your back on the line relief here. You use this point. I really got a whole bunch of marks here, but um, if it lands here, spins back, that's where it enters. And that's what you use for your back on the line relief. On a yellow, never ever have a two club length ruling. So, ball lost or out of bounds. Uh, out of bounds is when all of it's out. If it's on the line, it's in. Uh, good rule of thumb to remember is on is in. So, uh, in, these, in this diagram here, if it's touching the line, it's in play. It's touching, it's in play. If it's not touching, it's out. On is in. If it's out of bounds, whoops, sorry. Um, it costs you one stroke penalty. And if it's lost or out of bounds, stroke and distance means you always go back to where you previous played. You don't fire it into the bush and say, oh, I lost one. You bring it out onto the fairway and say, I'll just play from here. That 
is not under the normal rules. However, the new rules have indicated under model local rule E5 that they have this option. And this may be something you might want to consider as the beginner or with your group that you play that, for example, here you're, you're teeing up and you fired one uh, from here out of bounds at this point here. Uh, that becomes your, your reference point and you go equidistant. So let's, for the sake of argument, call us 100 yards. You go 100 yards to the fairway and that becomes your uh, fairway reference point. You get two club lengths on this side and you can drop a ball anywhere you want within this area mark C. Put a ball there and continue on play. Super, it speeds things up big time. Uh, so that's for out of bounds. And then this for uh, one you might've lost. So you're on the tee here, you fire it into the bush here. You have an estimate where it might be at position A. Uh, guesstimate where it is. You get two club lengths on the left side. Uh, bring it out equidistant from the flag to the fairway. You get two more clubs there. Now you create this big, huge dropping zone and you can drop your ball in there and play from there. The big difference is on stroke and distance, it costs you a stroke penalty, but you're going back to where you last hit. In this scenario, it costs you two strokes, but you don't have to go back, which is again, a pace of play issue. It just speeds things up. So speaking of uh, speeding things up, if you believe your ball might be lost or it's out of bounds, well, you can hit a provision. It just means you can hit a second one. And the only time you can do that is when it's lost or out of bounds, uh, lost outside of a penalty area. If you think your ball landed in water, you don't have an option of a provisional. You got to play under the under rule 17 and, and play from, uh, as we just mentioned, on the red or the yellow. Uh, a provisional ball is nothing but a backup in the sense of while you're looking for your original ball. So if you you fire your first one into these trees and go, holy mackerel, I might be lost. I'm going to hit a provisional and you duff it off the tee to point A. Uh, it doesn't mean you have to go up here, look, and then if you don't find it, come back. You can play your provisional up to and beyond the position of your ball. You just can't play it. Like you can fly it to position B, for example. You just can't go up and play it beyond the position of your original ball. Uh, so you can tee off of the provisional, fire it up here, go look for your original. You don't find it. Yeah, now you can go play B. You can keep playing with that. Uh, the only issue is if you go up here and let's say you, you fire a ball and you're one inch from the hole, uh, you that's a provisional. You go look for this original ball and you find it in those trees, your provisional is abandoned. You must play that original. So um, just something to factor in that, yeah, you can hit a provisional all you want. It does speed up play. It's a great option. Uh, but if you find your original, you abandon the, the uh, pardon, you find your original, you must abandon the provisional. You don't get a choice. Go, wow, I kind of like the provisional better. Uh, no, you don't get that option. So Unplayable ball, and I'm almost done here. Um, an unplayable ball is, is your choice. No one tells you the ball is unplayable. I can say, hey, I think my ball is unplayable. I'm going to take relief. And my partner looks at me and goes, no, I, you can play that. I, no, I choose. If I have a perfect lie in the middle of the ferry, I can call it unplayable if I wish. Uh, the only place you can't do that is in a penalty area. You must proceed under the penalty area under Rule 17. So three options when a ball is unplayable. Uh, again, we're gonna start here. They're, they're playing from the fairway. They fire it into the bush and they get there and there's trees everywhere. There's no way they can play this ball. Uh, their options are going back to position where they last hit it from. Where you hit it from becomes the reference point. You get a club length on each side. Your relief area, drop in, stay in. Or where your ball is unplayable, you've got the second option on back on the line relief. Your flag, go straight back. Pick a spot, doesn't matter where. That becomes your reference point. Club length either side, create your relief area, drop in, stay in. Or finally, your third option is where your ball lies. You can take two club lengths either side, not near the hole if you couldn't do it up here. Uh, up here. So create your relief area, drop in, stay in. And that's your options under one stroke. Now we'll take a look at if you had I'm gonna go right to here. If your ball is in a bunker and it's plugged and there's no way in the world you're gonna get this ball out, uh, you have still have options. So your ball's sitting at position three, it's horrible. 
There's no way you're going to play this ball. So you, you call it unplayable. You can always go back to where you last hit it under stroke and distance for one stroke penalty. You can take your lateral relief, which is two club lengths. And if two club lengths take you out of the bunker, you don't get to go out. You must stay within the bunker. Two club lengths, your relief area, drop in, stay in for one stroke. You still have the option of back on the line relief, but you have to stay in the bunker for one stroke. Again, same dropping procedure. Or as an additional option for two strokes, you can take it out of the bunker on back on the line relief, pick a spot, a reference point, club length, relief area, drop in, stay in. So uh, that's a phenomenal option, especially if you ever do any Scottish golf, because those bunkers are horrendous over there and uh, terrific options. So I apologize for running over because that is it, but I'm more than willing to uh, answer any questions if anybody has any. Um, I don't have to be anywhere. So I'm going to get out of this and get back to the Zoom if I can figure out how. And uh, I guess I can't. If anybody has any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. I believe uh, Kevin had a question earlier in the evening and he was asking if they, he should take the immediate uh, session in February 21st um, or is the session enough, say if he was going to play in a tournament. Uh, Don McDonald is on the presentation but on a phone I can't unmute him um, and he is the one that is going to be doing the presentation but he said yeah you should definitely take the presentation um, he's going to cover a lot of the same rules that Gord did but on another level um, a lot of it will be focused for those that are in tournaments whether it's a club tournament or a golf manitoba tournament or even a national tournament so yeah we invite you to join us for that anybody else okay we have a question here Hi, um gord i don't know if you can see it from Wally, um, is there a universal marking color for designating a waste bunker versus prepared bunker? Uh, no, and, and actually like a bunkers aren't marked. So um, you may get that indicate, that's a great question. And that like, if you do a lot of uh, Phoenix golf where there's a lot of waste bunkers versus a regular bunker that may indicate on a card as a, as a local rule or uh, yeah, I'm trying to think of how they're, they're marked. There is no marking of per se for a bunker, like a, like a red penalty area or a yellow penalty area. Um, that's a great question. I, like, it's just, like you would, might, might see it on the back of a scorecard for a local rule or uh, yeah, I really don't have a, a great answer for that one. Sorry. Gordon, a, yeah. This is Jim Gosman. Uh, Bob Peters asked me a question. I seem to vaguely remember having someone explain this, but I can't remember where it was. Are there any circumstances where um, we would allow the where the the nearest point of relief would actually be closer to the pin? And I remember some discussion at some uh, rules thing and some explanation i can't remember what the if there was an outcome there's a decision or an interpretation where uh not closer to the original lie of your ball but i think it was in relation to your reference point you create a reference point and that your drop could be nearer to the hole than your reference point yeah i remember that but this was to the yeah. closer to the pin and I can't, for the life of me, remember what the answer was. There was a. Yeah, that I, would be one of those ones I would know. be looking up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. As I mentioned in my first line there, there's absolutely no way you're going to remember them all. I mean, uh, this, uh, as Jim mentions, this, uh, this Bible here that, I mean, we live by this thing. It's just so much marked up and additions and things taped into it and um, we get this uh, clarifications on the rules of golf every couple of months from the RNA and the USGA that 
it's now in a binder for me. And th those are interpretations and changes to the rules even after they were written in 2019. Well, there were clarifications for the 2019 rules even before they were adopted. So um, they're constantly changing. And uh, I mean, not every situation can be um, contemplated. So, uh, and you'll see that a lot in the, actually in the old rule book, they say this, uh, a situation was not contemplated under the rules. Uh, therefore in equity, you do this or do that. So um, in the rule book, uh, well, in the previous one on the decisions you had, I think there were 1600 or 1800 decisions in there. Um, and, and that they pick ones out of that, out of a library of, you know, hundreds of thousands. So um, like, there's just no way you can know them all. But in that situation, if that came up to me in a, in a tournament, then I would go, I'll get back to you and I'll be reading that book. So now, I, yeah. I referred him to the USGA and the RNA websites where you can ask questions and uh, possibly get an answer back in the future. Well, I'll look it up myself because now I'm now you got me curious here. But drop, I, I I know there was something in there. I don't know if it was this book or the last one. So, um, or do we have some more questions on the chat? Hey, uh, let me see if I can figure that out. Here. I can read them to you if you want. Sure. As well. Okay. So from David, some courses do not mark water hazards. We now call them penalty areas. As red or yellow, how do you decide how to proceed? Yeah, great question. If uh, by definition a penalty, uh, a water hazard, um, it doesn't need to be marked. And so, uh, if it's not marked, it's deemed as red. So, um, if it doesn't, if it's not yellow, then it's red. And so, uh, and it doesn't have to be marked. Uh, a penalty area is how is it, uh, I'm looking at it, is an area from which relief for one stroke penalty is allowed. It's any body of water on the course, whether or not marked by the committee, including a sea, lake, pond, river, ditch, surface drainage ditch, or other open water course, even if not containing water, um, or any other part of the course the committee defines as a penalty area. Um, so it does not have to be defined uh, by red or yellow. But the key factor is if it's not defined, then it automatically becomes red. And so you get that other option of the lateral relief. Okay, so we, have a, okay. we have a question from Kevin. For team match play, what constitutes sharing equipment? Is it just clubs or does it extend to things like gloves, tees, yardage calculations? And then it goes on uh, things like range finders or GPS watches. Yeah, the only uh, sharing of equipment is it would be your clubs there. So, yeah, you can certainly share uh, a range finder. Uh, you could even share clubs in the sense of, but your total between your pair cannot be more than 14. So I could have seven clubs. My partner could have seven clubs, uh, which is fine. But um, sharing of an umbrella or a sweater or a pair of garbage mitts to keep you warm, that's not uh, equipment in, in the sense of sharing. So. Okay, we have a question from Wally. On a hole with no drop zone, where do you drop on an island green if your ball lands on the green and then rolls off the back? Yeah, that's a dandy. Like if you see a <laughs> dandy question, like you think of 17 at Sawgrass, TPC at Sawgrass, the island green. Um, and that green is, they do have a drop zone on that. And any drop zone is, uh, as we know on, on the red, you get three. On a yellow, you get two, and a drop zone is an additional option added under the model local rules. So that's an additional option. So the, as we know, if if it's marked red on a on an island green, then we our three conditions are we can always go back to where we last hit it under stroke and distance. That's one option. Two, we find where it entered the margin of the penalty area, and if it let's say it rolled over that green and splash, that's the point of entry. And you would get, if it's red, you get two club lengths from there. Um, it's tough uh, sometimes because your nearest point of relief at that point of entry may be close to the hole. And if it is for that two club lengths, perhaps the curvature of the water, then you eliminate that option. And then your only option would be back on the line relief. So 
It may be that you have to go a point of entry and then go behind the water onto another area of the golf course. Um, I'm thinking of uh, like the 14th hole at Bell Acres. I think it's 14, a par three. Um, the, the way the curve of that water uh, hazard there is that often balls will land, roll back in, and then you'll have to make a ruling and they are not too pleased with you when you tell them they either have to go back to the tee or they go behind over towards 13 fairway because the way the curve of that grass is or the, the shape of that uh, penalty area is any relief on that side of the water would be closer to the hole therefore you eliminate that option so although you're entitled to three you may eliminate one um, so that's I think in the reality of it is, I mean, that's a phenomenal question, but in the level of beginner golf, um, you'll be dropping it right where it went in. So tournament play, yeah, it'd be a little different, but I think for the uh, beginner golf, yeah, just get it out of there and uh, away you go. But I appreciate that question because it's, it's, a, it's a good one and one very often misunderstood. So anything else? No, uh, no more questions. Thanks everybody for attending tonight. We really appreciate it. If other questions come to mind, don't hesitate to email me at lisa at golfmb.ca. And I uh, know a guy or two or a gal and we can get that rules question answered for you. All right. I, I encourage you before you take off. I mean, I, I really do mean that there's no, there's no dumb questions. So, uh, and I encourage it because it, it keeps me sharp and I, I love looking them up like the one that Jim mentioned about the closer to the nearest point of relief and uh I'll be looking that up right now but uh it'll take a while because it there like I said there are lots and lots of options out there so by all means fire them through Lisa or whatever I'm more than happy to answer them. thanks Gord okay and Lisa thanks everybody